Hello, I'm Dr. Missick, and I want to conclude or continue the series on the sign of Jonah. So in the Gospel of Matthew, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests, they demand a sign from Jesus, from Yeshua, to show that he is the Messiah. And he says, an evil, unbelieving, and adulterous generation shall not be given a sign except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. And what it says is that as Jonah was in the belly of the, the fish, the whale, for three days and three nights, even so the Son of Man will be in the grave for three days and three nights. For the, the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, but now one greater than Jonah is here. Now, if you look at this verse, uh, certain people, I think these ideas were probably uh, promoted by, I think his name is Ralph Woodrow. He wrote a book called Babylon, Mystery Religion. He changed his beliefs on that, and he wrote a book about three days and three nights, uh, kind of re-examining his previous views. And of course, you also have Michael Rood. And Michael Rood is saying that the sign the sign is three days and three nights. And how he's interpreting that is that Jesus spent a complete 72 hours in the grave. 72 hours of you know, three full days and three full nights. So that's, that's the idea. Uh, I went to one of his teachings, Michael Roos' teachings on this. He's saying that if you don't understand that this is 72 hours, then you're in grievous sin. I remember I was talking to my uh, my stepmother, who unfortunately passed away, and we're talking about Good Friday, and she's saying, well, Good Friday is pagan. And it's like, okay, well, what exactly, how is, is Good Friday pagan? I'm not saying it's the right day, necessarily. But what is pagan about it? So, I want to look at certain things to kind of expand our view. The first problem that I have with the full 72 hours is what Michael Rood is proposing and others that, that follow this, this belief. And they don't count, they don't count, it's the Wednesday crucifixion, but they're not counting Wednesday, they're not counting the time of the day that, that Jesus is entombed, uh, it, or, or that night. It starts after a full night in, in, in the grave. Then they start counting all day Friday, all day Saturday. So, so no, I mean, it's all day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday. So we have three full days. But Wednesday, the day they're, they're dating as the crucifixion, for some reason it's not counted. I don't understand why they don't count it. So... The idea, and I was talking about this in the early lecture, is that it was a Passover Sabbath, right? John says it was a high Sabbath. What is a high Sabbath? A high Sabbath is a holy day, like Yom Kippur. I mentioned this. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, and whenever the Day of Atonement falls, if it falls on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it doesn't matter. It's a full Sabbath. You have to strictly observe the Sabbath, especially on Yom Kippur. Even though it doesn't, if it doesn't fall on a Sabbath day, a regular Saturday Sabbath, it still counts as a high Sabbath. So, John's Gospel says that the Sabbath is the day of the preparation in which Jesus is being crucified. Typically, that is understood as Friday. But when it says the day of the preparation, sometimes that was the day of the week. They would call Friday preparation because you're preparing for the Sabbath. But then he says that this was no general Sabbath. This was a high Sabbath because this was Passover. So this has led people to suppose that you had the Passover Sabbath and then the weekly Sabbath, you know, back to back, right? And uh, we see a lot of charts where they do this. And how they do it is you have Passover is a high Sabbath. Jesus is, is buried before the Passover Sabbath begins. And then you have... Uh, Friday, and then you have the Saturday weekly Sabbath, and they're saying, well, on Friday, the preparation day, the women are preparing uh, the ointments to anoint the body of, of Yeshua, of Jesus. But the problem is, 
I've been to Jerusalem. I remember <laughs> I decided I was going to go to Bethlehem, and I got a cab, and uh, we were in Bethlehem almost immediately. <laughs> it's like, what? We're in Bethlehem already? It's like less than, it seemed like it's less than five minutes. Uh, so Bethlehem is a few miles outside of Jerusalem. And we're not talking about the modern city of Jerusalem. We're talking about the old city. Um, it's kind of compact. Everything's close together. I don't understand why the women uh, need to buy the ointments, prepare the ointments, and yet a full day they can't go to the tomb, which is close by. The marketplace, the tomb aren't really all that far apart. And it doesn't make any sense that on that Friday, I don't understand why the women wouldn't have had time to buy the ointments, prepare them, and to anoint the body of, of Jesus. So that, I don't understand that. So people have different theories that perhaps uh, you get a Thursday crucifixion instead. So what ends up happening is this: these ideas... They seem to solve certain problems, but they actually create a lot more problems than they solve. And uh, I have this book here. This is is by some liberal theologians, but there's certain parts of this book which I think are uh, indisputable. And it's how he shows, in especially in the Gospel of Mark, we have day by day uh, what happens from. The, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem until um, the resurrection. Day by day, and in certain places we have hour by hour what's transposing. <clears throat> so if we open up the scriptures, especially the Gospel of Mark, we see Sunday, is how he puts it. When they were going, they were approaching Jerusalem, 11 verse 1. Monday, on the following day, 11 verse 12. Tuesday, the following morning, 11 verse 20. Wednesday, it was two days before the Passover, 14 verse 1. Thursday, it was the first day of unleavened bread, 14, uh, 12. Friday, as soon as this morning, 15, 1. Saturday, the Sabbath, 15, 24, 16 uh, verse 1. Sunday, very early on the first day of the week. Now you have the expression, the first day of the week, that's when the women go to the tomb. So you do have, I don't see how you can dispute that we have a, a Sunday resurrection. Uh, and they also show how on Friday we have, uh, how does he put it? Finally, Mark alone chronicles Friday's events in careful three hour intervals, like the Roman military watch times. 6 a.m. as soon as morning, 15 verse 1. 9 a.m. it was 9 o'clock in the morning, 1525. 12 noon, when it was noon, uh, that's 1533. 3 p.m. at 3 o'clock, 1534. And uh, 6 p.m. when the evening had come, 1542. So, what do you do about this? It sh Mark shows day by day what happened. I think Mark is the one that has the most complete um, chronology day by day. Uh, the Gospel of John mentions before Palm Sunday, as we call it, or the triumphal entry, we have the anointing of the, of the, of the feet uh, by Mary of Bethany. That must have been a, a dinner they had after the close of the Sabbath before the triumphal entry. Uh, so... What I'm saying is that Michael Rood took the initiative correctly to look at this. So he's trying to do his three days and three nights thing. But as we see in the Gospel of Mark, every day before that is accounted for, right? And I have to say quickly that because the expression high Sabbath is used, people suppose that that was a special Sabbath. But it could be that that the Passover happened to, on this year, begin on the weekly Sabbath. That's in the range of possibility. The Bible does not explicitly describe uh, two Sabbaths falling together. It's, it's not, that's something that people are, they're interpreting it that way, based on certain verses, uh, just leading people to that conclusion, but the Bible does not overtly say that when Jesus was, was uh, crucified, several Sabbaths, or at least a couple of Sabbaths, fell back to back. They're inferring that because John uses the expression of high Sabbath, that that Sabbath happened to be uh, the beginning of Passover. So 
I, I want to look at uh, looking at the, the the day by day thing. I think is is pretty important, but the the other thing we need to realize is that uh, the Bible doesn't explicitly say there's a full seventy two hours, and he's using one verse to argue that. If we look at this verse from the Gospel of Matthew, and we look at the parallel verse, Luke's account, Luke does not have the expression three days and three nights, probably because he didn't want to confuse the, the reader about how long that Yeshua was in the, in the tomb. I believe that the reason why that's used in Matthew is because the sign of Jonah Without that expression, the way it's read in the Gospel of Luke, the sign of Jonah seems to be the repentance and salvation of Gentiles. But Matthew's Gospel is clarifying that it's the, the idea that Jonah is a symbol of Yeshua, a symbol of Jesus, and that he's swallowed, he's entombed in the belly of the whale, and then he rises when he's regurgitated, uh, on the shore to fulfill his mission uh, to, to share the gospel of repentance. Uh, it's also interesting that we don't have access to them today, but we had Hebrew gospels. And when they had access to it, I mean, this isn't a new uh, issue. Bible scholars have been looking at this for 2,000 years. So what would happen is the church fathers went and said, okay, what is this? Uh, is it is it three full days, three full nights, or is it on the third day? So they consulted the Aramaic and Hebrew versions of the Gospel of Matthew. And the expression, three days and three nights, was not in the original Hebrew Matthew's manuscripts. So Michael Root is pinning everything on this one expression, three days and three nights. He's saying, it's not literal, it's not figurative, it's a full 72 hours, and if you don't understand that, you are pagan, you are wicked, and you are hopefully, hopelessly, hopelessly lost. That's Michael Rood's take on this. But another thing to think about is a full 72 hours, that means that Jesus did not rise on the third day. He's rising on the fourth or fifth day, if you count it like that. And uh, I want to look at one more thing from the Gospel of, of Luke, which I think is very important. And then we're going to examine the idea of the third day. So let's go to the Gospel of Luke. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that I'm right, this is the answer, this is the solution. I'm just saying that these people present these theories and they're, they're hateful and mean-spirited about it. You know, if you don't understand that Jesus was in the tomb a full 72 hours, you're not a believer, you're hopelessly lost, you're wicked, you're pagan. That's what Michael Root is saying, that you're an evil person uh, if you think that Jesus rose again on the third day. It has to be, you have to believe that he rose again on the fourth or, the first, uh, the fourth or fifth day based on his understanding. So, look at this. Jesus is buried on Wednesday, according to Michael Root. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we have the empty tomb on Sunday. That means... The fifth day, right? And it would have been pointless to go anoint the body after five days. I mean, look at the, the situation with Lazarus. It's the fourth day. They didn't want to open the tomb because the process of decay had already begun. Women have, the women have to get there to anoint his body before the process of decay begins. Why would they, they go to the tomb on the fifth day after his entombment. And like I said, for some reason, Michael Rue doesn't count that day, but how could you not, <laughs> right? He dies on Wednesday, he's, he's buried on Wednesday, the women come to the tomb on the fifth day, process of decay already began, there wouldn't have been any point in them at that point anointing the body, and like Mary and Martha, they would have said, don't open the tomb. They would have missed their opportunity. And that's why I don't understand where they have the Friday, Michael Rue and his followers, and they just buy... <laughs> They buy the the uh, uh, the ointments, and yet they don't anoint his body on that day. It doesn't make any sense. So, if you look at what these people said in the road to Emmaus, there's something interesting here. So Jesus appears, and he hides his identity from these apostles or these disciples. He says, 
What are you discussing? This is, uh, by the way, this is Luke ch chapter 24, uh, verse 17. Jesus says, What are you discussing with each other while you were walking along? And they stood uh, still looking sad. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, he answered and said, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know these things that have taken place in these days? And he said, Then what, what things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet. A prophet. He is a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Okay. It's the third day since these things took place. Not the fourth or fifth day. The things that took place is Jesus' arrest, crucifixion, and death. So, uh, that seems like the, the third day is not the fifth day, Right? They're saying it's the day before yesterday. And that's probably why Luke left that expression about three days and three nights out of his gospel. Because uh, how, how does he say in the beginning of this gospel? People were confused by that. It's not in the, the Hebrew Matthew. I think that uh, when this is written in the Greek version of, of, uh, of Luke, that statement was put in there to clarify that Yeshua was talking about his own resurrection and not the miracle of the conversion of Gentiles. Luke writes, Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of this word, I too have decided, after investigating everything carefully from the first, to write an orderly account to you, O most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning these things which you have been instructed. So, Luke is saying that he diligently studied these things to arrive at the truth and facts about it. And he says it's the third day. So, this is in Ralph Woodrow's book as well. We're looking at one verse, which is not repeated in the Gospel of, of uh, the parallel statement, the parallel version, parallel version of the Gospel of Luke. It's not in the Hebrew Gospels. One verse, and what Michael Root is saying, is that we have to throw away the rest of the Council of Scripture. Ignore what Luke says in his own Gospel, how he describes the resurrection. Uh, because Michael Root is right, and the Scriptures are wrong. The third day, not the fifth day, the third day. Is it the third day, or is it after three days and three nights? There's a prophecy of the third day is found in Hosea 6, verse 2. Paul says that the prophecy of rising on the third day refers to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 5, 4. And there's another interesting verse. How does Jesus understand the third day to be? Well, Jesus describes what he views as the third day. Jesus speaks about the third day in Luke 13, 32. So, he is being threatened by Herod Antipas. The Pharisees came, his friends among the Pharisees, and said, Get away from here, for Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Jesus says to him, to them, Go and tell that fox for me, listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will complete my work. I'll be perfected, right? So Jesus says today, tomorrow, and the third day. So that would be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? I mean, <laughs> that's how he, he doesn't put, you know, five days in there the way Michael Rue does. So... Let's look at these, these scriptures. Uh, let's start at, okay, first we see Hosea 6.2, the Old Testament prophecy of uh, rising on the third day. And then we see 1 Corinthians 15.4, where Paul says that Jesus is rising on the third day, not the fourth or fifth day, but the third day in fulfillment of the prophecy of Hosea 6.2. And then when, when, back to when Yeshua is talking to uh, the men on the road, uh, what does he say? Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And as we saw in uh, Luke chapter 13, 32, we see how Jesus arrives at the third day. It's not Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the fifth day, right? He's saying it's today, tomorrow, and, the, and then on the third day. But Michael Rood counts it differently. From the scriptures and from Jesus Christ. He's saying that, that Jesus is wrong and the apostles are wrong. 
and his interpretation of one single verse, uh, which isn't supported in the parallel scripture in, in Luke, and uh, the manuscripts of the, the Hebrew gospel don't have that expression in it at all. Um, so we see that in chapter 24, 20, 21, Cleopas thinks it's the third day since his crucifixion. But actually, according to Michael Root, Cleopas, who was there, Cleopas is there. But Michael Root says Cleopas was wrong. <laughs> Cleopas doesn't know what he's talking about. Michael Root does. He knows more than God himself. He knows more than people who are at the tomb. He knows more than people who were there and saw Jesus. So you have to ignore them and listen to Michael Root. Now, Michael Rue wants us to take one verse, his interpretation of one verse. Oh, he's not alluding to the gospel of us. He's not, he's not alluding to, uh, to the Jonah. He's not evoking Jonah. He's putting a, a solid time frame on there. And if you don't understand Michael Rue's time frame, you're going to go to hell, according to Michael Rue. Jesus says he's going to rise from the dead on the third day. Matthew, <laughs> Matthew, in Matthew, we got where this, where Michael Rood selects this verse. It says the third day, not after three days and three nights. It says the third day in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, uh, Matthew 17, 23, Matthew 20, 19. This is Jesus Christ himself saying he's going to rise on the third day. But oh, Michael Rood, no, 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 Jesus, you're wrong. You're not rising on the third day. You're rising on the fifth day, according to the way he constructs it. Luke chapter 9, verse 22, we also have once again, and then we have we already quoted Jesus uh, using the expression three days and three nights. And uh, this is uh, an expression. There's you know, the change the water to wine was on the third day. The healing of Hezekiah was, you know, it's an Old Testament expression, the third day, which seems to mean, Usually, it's like the day after tomorrow. Uh, it's used in creation. It's used in the story of Jacob and the story of Jonathan and, and uh, David. Uh, when they prepare to meet God at Mount Sinai, uh, they're supposed to cleanse themselves uh, and be prepared on the third day. Uh, there's other stories throughout the scripture uh, where the expression the third day is used. It seems to have been a common figure of speech. But uh, it seems to be different to me, from three days and three nights. So, in conclusion, in conclusion, you know, I guess it's possible Michael Root is correct. Yeah. And maybe, but the thing is, it's like, these traditions, the tradition of the third day is based on a different interpretation of Scripture. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, but this is how people are, are looking at um, the preponderance of evidence from the text of Scripture. So, Michael Roos says, ignore the preponderance of evidence and take this one verse. And this verse is extremely literal. It means, a th it means more, more than 72 hours. It's, all, it's Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night. And then, and then the empty tomb is discovered on, uh, on Sunday. You can't get away from that. And another thing about Michael Roos, I'll mention this. I, I'd, I'd forgotten about it, which is important. Michael Rood. Monica Rood says that Palm Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, was on the Sabbath day, which is absurd. It's impossible. But like I said, you have to go mark these people. This is the last week by uh, uh, Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crisson. I know they're liberals, but uh, in this instance, they're just going, that's not, I don't think they're really trying to espouse liberalism in this book. They're just looking at the last week of Jesus, but they are liberals. Um, but you have to go, they're correct. The Gospel of Mark has a very clear time frame, not just day by day, but in certain cases, uh, watch by watch, or you know, the, the time frame, the hours by hours in the Gospel of, uh, uh, of Mark. So, Michael Rudy, he's, he's committed to 72 hours, and he has to work backwards in the way he puts it together. Palm Sunday is on a Saturday. It's telling me that something's wrong with this. And he's saying, oh, well, you know, on Friday they put all the, the palm leaves out there. And they're not breaking the Sabbath by uh, waving the time, the, the, uh, the palm leaves. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Jesus would tell people, you know, rise, pick up your bed, and, and walk. And what was his bed? His bed was basically a towel, <laughs> you know? A mat. 
So a, a man's laying there, lame, and, and Jesus says, rise, pick up your mat, which is basically a cloth, and walk. And so this man has this, this rolled up piece of cloth, and the scribes and the Pharisees is like, why are you carrying that? You're breaking the Sabbath. Well, a man healed me, and he told me to pick it up. Who is this man? Well, you know. Oh, it turns out it's Jesus of Nazareth. So uh, if they think picking up a towel and rolling it up behind your under your arm is breaking the Sabbath, you think they're going to say that picking up um, palm leaves and waving them is not breaking the Sabbath? Um, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, Jesus told somebody to stretch out your arm, and, he, and that, that by stretching out his arm, he was healed, and they accused him of breaking the Sabbath. So how could picking up uh, palm leaves and waving, waving them around in, in this culture that Jesus existed in not be a breaking of the Sabbath. So what's going on here is Michael Rood has an interpretation and he's going to... We've seen cult groups do this all the time. Like uh, one is Pentecostals. And uh, they have to ignore or reject what the scripture says because their theory is wrong, but they want to impose it in the scripture. To them, their theory, their interpretation is correct, and so they have to deny scripture or common sense or logic to affirm their theory. So in the end of the... There's a, a proverb talking about you know, these, these wicked things that displeases, displease the Lord, and one of these things is, see, he who goes about spreading discord among the brethren. And um, we need to be loving and kind and uh, something like that. You know, it doesn't matter in the end if, if, you know, if it was a full 72 hours or not. I doubt it was, based on what the scripture says. But, I mean, isn't it the point that Jesus died and rose again? Not exactly how long he was in the tomb. Uh that you know, God loves the world and wants to save mankind, that Jesus made the sacrifice, that we could have peace with God and reconciliation. Isn't that the big point? Why are we, or why is Michael Rood and his, his minions so obsessed with a time frame and their theory, and then they're just so unloving and unkind and argumentative and trying to say everyone is pagan? And it's like, well, okay. I, like I said, it's like, what, what if, if, uh, if Jesus is crucified on a Friday and rose again on, this, on a Sunday, what's pagan about it? Exactly what? We know a lot about pagan religions in the Middle East. We know about Egyptian religions. We know about the, the Greco-Roman gods. I mean, how is it pagan? It's, it's not. It's based on an understanding of Scripture. And if it's wrong, we still don't need to be uh, a wrong interpretation of Scripture. We don't need to be uh, so unloving, so unkind, and... Uh, uh, trying to create dissension, division, and controversy about something which, in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of petty. Uh, you know, it, it, counting days. Oh, Jesus had to be in there exactly 72 hours. Actually, over 72 hours. Uh, but I, I think that misses the point that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He paid the price. He died. He rose again. And he ascended on high and he's coming again. That's what's important. Not. Um, how many hours or moments or days exactly he was in the tomb. And uh, these are distractions, uh, and they're also setting division and setting Christians, uh, making accusations <laughs> against people. It's not loving. Uh, there are all kinds of pagan things, especially in the world today. You know, we got this new transgenderism thing going on. We have the problem with abortion, uh, you know, Tens of millions of babies killed in mother's womb. Uh, sinfulness, greed, wickedness, idolatry, the occult. I mean, there's a lot of things for us to argue about and to teach about uh, from the Council of Scripture. And instead of getting all tied up in a knot, uh, getting wrapped around an axle over exactly what three days and three nights means. You know, that's what the devil wants. The devil wants people arguing about uh, these non-essentials so that we're distracted. We're divided against ourselves, we're distracted from impacting uh, the world with the kingdom of God. And we're arguing about, you know, three days and three nights and not saving souls and bringing souls in the kingdom. And actually, I don't think Michael Brood is bringing a lot of souls in the kingdom. 
Uh, he's creating a lot of division. He's turning people away. And on top of that, there are people who are interested in the Jewish roots, and they see him and his bad spirit, and it, it turns people away from the Messianic movement. So uh, we need to look at the Scripture and see what's, what's right and what's wrong, and uh, look at the preponderance of evidence from the Bible. And I think that there are holes in this theory, right? And uh, it doesn't match up with the Scriptures, and that's what we need to, we need to follow the Bible, and uh, not false teachers and people like Michael Rood. Let's go to the scriptures and what the scriptures say and stand on that.